Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and for that uh, um, kind introduction. Um, these are going to be the, the lesions I'm going to talk about today. Um, I have no uh, relevant disclosures. Um, we'll start off talking about uh, tumors uh, in the retina and then move on to the optic nerve. And to start with, I just wanted to review retinal histology and the glia you find in the retina, since uh, some folks here may not look uh, um, commonly at eyes. So in the retina, you have radial glia, which are known as Muller glia. And like ra other radial glia, they're going to span the entire um, uh, extent of the retina. Um, so you have the cell body here in the, um, uh, it's not working. Uh, the, the cell body in the uh, uh, internuclear layer and these long processes that extend to the internal limiting membrane and the inner aspect of the retina and out to the photoreceptors. Interesting, these molar glia um, uh, only become GFAP positive in, in a reactive state. The, the normal resting molar glia aren't uh, GFAP positive. Uh, as with other radial glia and elsewhere in the brain, these, these have a lot of stem and progenitor properties um, uh, and are, are can become quite proliferative. Astrocytes in the retina are largely restricted to the nerve fiber layer. This is the axons from the ganglion cells that are going back to form the optic nerve. Um, you can see them as these uh, elongated oval cells in the nerve fiber layer. Um, when you stain with uh, GFAP, you can see these um, uh, around blood vessels and uh, um, with the extending processes in the nerve fiber layer uh, down into the uh, interplexiform, interplexiform layer. Uh, maybe a hint of radial glial processes in the deeper portions of this retina as well. Um, as in the brain, these astrocytes are important in for forming a barrier uh, with blood vessels. And here on this GFAP stain, you can see the GFAP positive astrocytic processes um, abutting the, the blood vessels extending down into the retina. Um, it's sort of interesting, these glia in the retina, they enter the retina relatively late uh, in uh, fetal development, and they sort of spill out of the optic nerve head and move uh, externally towards the retinal periphery um, and act as a guide for the growing vasculature. So they're really quite intimately associated with the de overall development of the retina, and particularly with the development of the retinal vasculature. So turning to our first uh, tumor today, uh, this goes by a, a number of different names, probably most commonly called retinal astrocytic hamartoma, sometimes called giant cell uh, astrocytoma of retina. Uh, these tend to occur in patients who have a tuberous sclerosis. Occasionally, you can see uh, sporadic lesions or uh, similar appearing tumors in patients with uh, NF1 or retinitis pigmentosa, but, but generally associated with TS. Uh, they tend to be uh, rather benign or indolently growing lesions. Uh, clinically, they have two um, types, main types of presentations. They can be sort of smooth and noun calcified or, or more heavily calcified and sometimes multinodular. Uh, here's an um, uh, example of the two major microscopic appearances of the tumor. They can uh, be comprised of sort of bland uh, spindled cells, um, and other lesions have more of what's called the giant cell uh, component, where you have the, in the lower right, where you have these larger cells, prominent nuclei, uh, big nucleoli. Now, for the neuropathologists in the crowd, and you look at these giant cells down on the right, this will, of course, remind you of another tumor that we see in the brain in patients with tuberous sclerosis, which is the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. And really, these um, uh, astrocytic hamartomas in TS patients in the retina um, basically have a spectrum of appearances which is quite similar to what you see in SIGAs in the brain. Here's an example from uh, Wilmer. Uh, this one, um, you can see this, this very discrete tumor arising from the retina and fundoscopic exam. This one happened to be highly calcified. You can see all these refractile um, spherules of calcium sort of popping out of uh, the tumor uh, on the left. Um, over here, is this a pointer? No, yeah. So over here on the right, notice how, how sharp the demarcation is between the more normal looking retina and uh, this, this heavily calcified tumor mass. Um, oh, and oh, then uh, you can see here some of these larger cells that are somewhat Siegel-like in the middle of this calcification. Here's another example from our lab of a, um, a well-defined tumor. Um, you can see here very sharp lateral edges um, arising from the inner retina uh, in the posterior pole. Here's the uh, optic nerve coming in. 
at higher magnification, you can really see how the, the, it's not invading into retina in any significant way. The retinal morphology on either side of this particular case is well uh, maintained, and you just have this sort of bland, spindled mass of glial cells, uh, some limited blood vessels in there, but it's not heavily vascularized like the um, uh, next uh, type of tumors we'll talk about. The higher mag view, again, showing these, these very bland, spindled cells, glial cells, lack of mitotic activity. Now, um, there have been some nice studies correlating uh, the pathology in patients with tuberous sclerosis with other clinical features. Uh, this was a series from Cleveland Clinic in which they looked at 132 patients um, with TS. Uh, and in those 132 patients, 36% had these astrocytic hematomas in their eyes. And in 43% uh, percent of the patients who had tumors, they were bilateral. So uh, as with retinoblastoma, they can be uh, bilateral. And um, uh, in patients who had these retinal lesions, they more frequently found uh, clinical findings such as cognitive impairment, epilepsy, and uh, SIGAs in the CNS. So um, uh, manifesting um, these in the retina is going to be associated with uh, more aggressive features elsewhere uh, in these patients as well. Um, occasionally, these tumors can behave in a more aggressive fashion. Here's a series of um, four cases that was published by Dr. Eagle. Um, uh, you can see um, these um, uh, are, are larger tumors than the ones I'd shown you previously. And here in this uh, PO, or this rather um, uh, eye, which the uh, initial collot's been taken off, you can see a detached retina here, this, this whitish substance, and then a very large tumor here adjacent to the detached retina. Um, these are more pictures from Ralph's paper. Uh, here's another case, uh, very really a huge tumor filling the eye, uh, neovascularization on the surface of the iris uh, due to hypoxic tumor, similar to what, to what we just saw in retinoblastoma. Um, here's one, uh, a cut through the optic nerve head, and you can see not just the bland cells I'd shown you uh, in those cases uh, from Wilmer a second ago, but uh, in addition, some necrotic areas, um, um, but the viable cells had, did still have this sort of sega like morphology. Again, another parallel to SEGAs, uh, this is still pictures from Ralph's paper, uh, is the fact that these have, are really, while we're calling them astrocytomas, they have, uh, they express both glial and neuronal uh, markers. So these, these large giant cells have essentially a, a biphenotypic um, expression of uh, glial markers such as GFAP and neuronal markers, and in this case, um, uh, NSE. Um, Ralph had noted that uh, some of the giant cells uh, uh, in his tumors uh, express neuronal but not glial markers. Now, for these more aggressive tumors, obviously it would be nice to have a chemotherapy that could be used rather than a nucleation. Um, and so uh, with, with SEGAs, of course, there has been some success in treating them uh, using uh, a drug that's going to target the, the pathway that's activated, uh, such as Everolimus. And so here's data from a published study in which about half of the patients showed a 50% greater reduction um, or more greater reduction in the size of these brain tumors after two years of therapy. There's not as much data from uh, treating using similar approaches to treat tumors of the retina, but there was a paper that came out about a year ago now from China in which they had looked at uh, seven patients and there were multiple lesions uh, in the patients. And so here on the right, they, showed a sh they show the percent decrease in size of the, the tumors that were being treated um, with uh, serolimus. So you're getting between marginal decreases to maybe a 25% decrease in tumor size. But I think there's real promise here in using these sorts of therapies for aggressive astrocytic hamartomas in tuberous sclerosis patients. So what other tumors, what other gliomas can you see in the eye? Well, really probably the most common one that you might encounter if you uh, look at eyeballs at your institution is the so-called uh, vasoproliferative tumor, also known as massive retinal gliosis. Um, as we'll discuss, neither of these names, which are the most commonly used ones, are, are, are perfect, and I think there's some new proposals that may be better. And these generally arise in eyes in which there's some inciting event. It could be a sort of chronic inflammation, uveitis, trauma, congenital malformations, retinal detachment. There's something that gets the ball rolling uh, in, it, in these cases. And they're basically comprised of tightly packed uh, spindled astrocytes uh, and are generally uh, associated with, with prominent vasculature. <laughs> 
Here's an example uh, from uh, our institution, a 75-year-old male in which the eye was enucleated 20 years after there had been a, um, ocular trauma, and you can see this, this white uh, mass of uh, glia filling the eye with a, a numerous fairly large uh, vessels scattered throughout the lesion. Uh, when you look under the microscope, you can see these, these variably sized vessels with blood, and then all these densely packed uh, um, uh, solid masses of proliferating tumor cells in between the blood vessels. Just a higher uh, magnification view, and you can see how there's a, there tends to be a perivascular orientation uh, in these spindled glia uh, around the blood vessels. Um, it's somewhat similar to what you can see in a pendomoma, and I'll discuss in a second the possibility that the suggestion some have made that, that these might be uh, a pendomoma in the eye. So, as I mentioned, the, the nomenclature is variable, um, and I think both of the historical terms have some issues with them. Uh, the, the term vasoproliferative tumor sort of implies that this is primarily a vascular uh, problem, but I think most people believe now that the vascular elements are, are secondary, and in fact, they're not always present. So, uh, you know, really, it's a, it's a problem of glia, um, thus I think this, this name is, is not optimal. Massive retinal gliosis, um, which goes back over 50 years now, is um, a well-accepted term. It does capture a, a lot of what's going on. However, in, in a significant number of cases, including the initial case series in which this, this name was coined, it's more of a focal nodule. It's not a massive gliosis filling the eye. So there, there are some problems with, with this um, uh, terminology as well. So here's, for example, an exam uh, a, a case from again from Wilmer, uh, where it was a, 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 that was nucleated from a 33-year-old man uh, who had uh, chronic inflammation known as uveitis and retinal detachment. Um, and over three years, this thing grew. Um, but you can see, so here's the sclera, here's the lesion. This is a relatively small, you don't have a sense of scale, but this is a relatively small focal thing, again, with the prominent vessels in it. So this is not massive, really, in the grand scheme of things. Here's um, histologic uh, pictures from this same tumor. Again, you can see a fairly sharp uh, demarcation from adjacent retina. Um, here's the lesion. Unlike the astrocytic hamartomas of TS, again, you have all these large blood vessels in this particular case, which you can see on higher magnification here. Um, and uh, another high mag photo here. It looks very similar to the prior case I showed you. Occasionally, and it was true in this case, you can have these you know, more elongated processes that uh, in this case are not really around blood vessels but are uh, near the um, underlying choroid. So it has been suggested that maybe these are, are ependymomas in the eye. Uh, there's, this is really the main paper uh, putting that view forward, uh, Baron Scheitauer. Um, uh, was, was a proponent of this notion. Um, there wasn't a lot of genetic data or clinical data. It was more based on morphology, and there were some uh, yeah, EMA dot-like inclusions and microlumens in there that would be similar to what one sees in a um, I, I would say this notion really hasn't gained traction um, uh, in the community at this point. Uh, my, my personal thoughts would be that it, unless you could show some sort of genetic similarity. I mean, overall, I, I don't think these are, are ependymomas. I think it, the, the perivascular orientation is more just the way these glia grow uh, when, when the, um, in the eye. So there was another study that, that came out uh, recently addressing some of these issues that include a number of neuropathologists, Ari Perry, Dan Bratt, as well as uh, the ophthalmic pathologist uh, at Emory, Hans Grossnaklaus, who is the senior author. And, and they addressed the number, they looked at uh, uh, four cases, and they were asking you know, the question, one, um, is it really the, the astrocytes of the blood vessels that are, are primary drivers here? They felt like this was major, mostly an astrocytic proliferation with secondary vascular involvement. They noted that they can see sometimes Rosenthal fibers in eosinophilia granular bodies and their tumors. I, I tend in the you know, 10 or so cases I've seen, um, I've not seen uh, so much in the way of Rosenthal fibers or in the granular bodies. I don't think those are common features of these lesions. And, and they started to get at the important issue of, of is this a reactive or a clonal neoplastic lesion? Ne uh, um, lesion? Uh, and they looked specifically for um, uh, molecular changes found in uh, gliomas in the CNS, including BRAF fusions and IDH mutations, and they didn't see those uh, in those four cases. Um, and and uh, Hans had proposed the name reactive retinal astrocytic tumor for these because he felt like that encompassed, you better characterize what was going on. And I tend to agree with him. I think this is probably a superior nomenclature. 
Um, there, there, there's only limited additional genetic data for these. Here is a study of a case report uh, from Japan in which they'd used a uh, Humara uh, engine receptor assay and had not found any um, clonal, you know, presumptively neoplastic um, um, uh, event in this sing a single additional case. Um, there's not been a lot of gene expression profiling. Here's a, a, a very recent study from uh, Deepak Edward, an ophthalmic pathologist pa practicing um, in Saudi Arabia, and they had done um, uh, expression microarrays uh, in the tumor from this 28-year-old gentleman that had grown over 18 months. Um, and basically, uh, they, 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 the major pathways are upregulated were not surprisingly astrocytic markers, inflammatory markers, extracellular matrix markers. Uh, there's been suggestion over the years that these tumors arise from molar glia, but in this single case, they didn't find any signs of upregulation of molar glial markers, suggesting that maybe it's not originating from these radial glia, but from astrocytes. And he also had not seen a, a lot of uh, upregulation of uh, vascular markers in this uh, single case uh, looked at by um, gene expression arrays. Now we've looked at a couple cases that have come uh, in the last year or two using molecular analyses. Here is one that was a, an in-house case, sort of a standard looking case, uh, masses of GFAP positive glia, uh, large PAS positive blood vessels. Um, and we had sent this for array CGH and it was a, um, there were no karyotypic abnormalities by array CGH in this case. But there was a second case we had gotten in consultation from Sarah Coupland, who'd sent it from England, and it had, uh, Ralph Eagle had looked at it as well. Uh, her case was a very aggressive one. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the photos of it. Um, but it actually filled the eye and perforated through a posterior scleral defect. So it was growing very aggressively uh, in the eye, and um, although the morphology was fairly typical of, of these lesions. And interestingly, when I sent that case for um, array CGH, there actually was monosomy 6. Um, so in some of these, you can see genetic alterations, and, and it's possible that some of these actually do have uh, clonal uh, genetic uh, changes in them. But, but really, I think we, we just don't know a lot about what's going on genetically in these tumors. Um, finally, I should mention that the, if you, if you start reading the literature, you will see a, a handful of case reports. They tend to be older, uh, claiming to see oligodendroglia, uh, oligodendrogliomas in the eye. Um, the, the eye, the, the, the nerve fibers inside the eye in, in normal eyes should not be myelinated. There's not oligodendroglia there. Um, uh, so it would be surprising to find oligodendrogliomas in the eye. And in fact, um, the, these, these case reports are largely just based on h &E morphology where they said, wow, there's lots of little round cells and I think it must be an oligodendroglioma. There's no genetics backing this up. Some of these have subsequently been shown to be retinocytomas uh, of the uh, sort that, that Ralph uh, um, had shown in the last talk. So, um, but just be aware that there, there are papers out there claiming that there are oligodendrogliomas in CIDI, but I, I don't think there's a lot of good data to support that. So let's now uh, turn to the subject of gliomas in the optic nerve. So just to, again, orient folks to the optic nerve, I think most of you are well aware of this, but for non-pathologists in the crowd, uh, uh, as you get closer to the eye, you have the central retinal artery and vein, um, the, the arachnoid and dural coverings of the nerve, and then all these packets of axons coursing back to the brain. And at higher magnification, you can see that here, there are lots of oligodendroglial cells, but also lots of astrocytes uh, um, uh, uh, in these um, uh, cells that are separated by peel septa. Uh, here's just a picture of a GFAP stain uh, out towards the leptomeninges, and you can see the GFAP negative leptomeninges and all these astrocytes in the optic nerve. So almost all of these optic nerve gliomas, of course, are pilocytic astrocytomas. Occasionally, uh, very rarely, you'll see ganglia gliomas and high-grade astrocytomas in the nerve. Um, there was a series of uh, uh, 1,200 orbital lesions reported from wills by the shields, and 4% uh, um, of them, 48 of them, were optic gliomas. That gives you an idea of how common they are as uh, orbital lesions. Um, about a quarter of the patients have uh, uh, evidence of NF1 uh, who have optic gliomas, and of course, in the context of NF1, these can be bilateral tumors. Here's a case um, uh, which nicely highlights the, the typical growth pattern in the nerve. When they're in the optic nerve proper, they tend to sort of expand and distend the dura like a sausage, which you can see radiographically. And then when you take these uh, specimens out, you, you have this very distended sausage-like um, 
uh, growth of the optic nerve. They only get outside the dura very, very, very rarely. It's, it's like a case report to see these things get outside the dura um, of the optic nerve. In this particular case, you see it extending posteriorly back towards the chiasm. And of course, as, as we'll see later, these kind of rise first in the hypothalamic region or chiasm and then extend down the nerve. When you look at these gross specimens, um, sometimes the tumor stays mainly within the parenchyma uh, of the optic nerve proper, but often you'll see it spilling out into the arachnoid, the subarachnoid space. And there's been a bit of controversy and perhaps some ongoing controversy over the, the years as to what this proliferation in the leptomeninges is. And particularly in older reports, they, they refer to this as meningothelial proliferation. And indeed, um, that there is, you can, certainly can see true meningothelial proliferation out here. But in the 50 or 100 true optic nerve gliomas that I've looked at, I would say more frequently it's, it's, it's actually glial tumor cells proliferating, proliferating out here in the uh, coverings uh, and distending. So you can see both, but I, I think more often this is going to end up being glial tumor than leptomeningeal cells. Uh, here's a cross section, a picture I took from uh, one of Peter's books. Um, and you know, in this particular case, there, there, was, uh, there was a tumor um, in the um, optic nerve proper, but also a lot of you know, glial tumor out here in the leptomeninges. So of course, the, the morphology is similar to what we see in pilocytic astrocytomas at other sites. Uh, one can find, uh, um, generally speaking, Rosenthal fibers in the tumors. One can find eosinophilic granular bodies uh, in the tumors. Um, but you can also see other uh, variants uh, occurring um, in the um, uh, uh, optic pathway gliomas, particularly those rising in the hypothalamic region around the chiasm can uh, have uh, be of the so-called pylomyxoid variant. So, um, and I'll show pictures of those. Oops. Is this? Oh, it's not. I'm sorry. This is the, this is the wrong version of my talk. Okay. I'd inserted some nice uh, pictures last night of pylomyxoid astrocytomas, which uh, I guess we reverted somehow to the earlier talk. Anyway, so the pylomyxoid astrocytomas, of course, um, have uh, a um, blander morphology. You tend to see these bland spindled cells, often with a myxoid stroma surrounding blood vessels. Um, uh, and they're, they're quite common uh, in younger children uh, in the hypothalamic region. Um, for, for a time, it was thought that they might represent a, um, a unique entity. Uh, however, um, with time, we've come to realize that the genetics are, are quite similar to the, the broader spectrum of pilocytic astrocytoma. The, um, uh, and in fact, you can have tumors not infrequently that present initially as a pylomyxoid astrocytoma, and then following treatment, they'll recur. And when you look at the histology of the recurrent tumor, it's matured and taken on a more classic pilocytic appearance with Rosenthal fibers, uh, dense pyloid regions. Um, in other cases, you can have lesions that present initially at initial resection with some areas that look pylomyxoid, other areas that look more classically pilocytic. So at this point, um, the, the, the thinking is that pylomyxoid change is not reflective of a distinct entity, but just part of the spectrum, uh, maybe an immature, more aggressively growing spectrum of what you can see in pilocytic astrocytoma. So what is the natural history of pilocytic astrocytoma? Well, most of them remain stable. Uh, however, some uh, can spontaneously regress. Um, uh, um, so uh, wh while a lot of them are stable and spontaneously regress, you, there is a significant subset that will grow uh, in impact vision and, and cause blindness. Uh, in terms of the, the syndromic cases, it tends to be the, the sporadic non-syndromic cases that arise uh, earlier and are more likely to grow uh, rapidly. The, the NF-associated ones are, are tend to be a bit more indolent. Um, uh, the genetics uh, is, is being uh, been worked out pretty well over the last five to ten years. We're still learning new things. Um, but the, the, main, the most common genetic event are, are changes in the BRAF oncogene. And uh, a number of labs around the world um, about uh, uh, 10 years ago or so uh, were looking at pilocytic astrocytomas. This is just a paper from our group. And we all found sort of the same thing, which was duplications of a two megabase region that encompassed uh, the BRAF locus. Uh, and what that duplication uh, causes is a fusion between the, the active kinase domain of BRAF and the promoter region and uh, N-terminal coding region of a, a Kia gene, 
And it, it's the RAS binding region that's not uh, um, uh, included uh, from BRAF. So this, this part of the BRAF gene that's not included in the fusion is the negative regulatory region that keeps the kinase activity in check. So what you end up with is diffuse expression in neural tissues of this constitutively active RA, uh, BRAF kinase. And so this is a, quite a common change uh, you can see in these. Um, um, and uh, we had tried to model this uh, uh, in uh, human neural stem cells. We took human neural stem cells and introduced, uh, initially shown here, be the BRAF E600E. Subsequently, uh, folks have used the fusions and see similar things. And what happens is when you, when you introduce these active BRAF kinases, is there's an initial proliferative burst um, uh, and clonogenic burst of growth. But then eventually, those cells are going to stop growing. And that's very similar to what you see in nevi on your skin, where you have solar damage to the melanocytes. Uh, the melanocytes proliferate. They form a, a mole or a nevus. But then by and large, that's going to stop growing. And that process is thought to be mediated by oncogene-induced senescence, where the same BRAF kinase eventually is going to induce uh, P16 and P53 that are going to shut down proliferation um, and make things stop growing. Now, occasionally in the skin, of course, uh, they don't stop growing. They progress to melanoma. Um, and that, that's generally in the skin associated with loss of P16, you know, loss of the, the breaks or chet points uh, that are the, the, the drivers of uh, senescence. Um, and we can see similar kinds of P16 loss uh, in the more aggressive pilocytic astrocytomas. So when you look at pilocytic astrocytomas, at least in our study, we found that P16 loss um, at the protein level uh, is associated with a more aggressive behavior of these tumors. And uh, 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 Nada Habato's group, at the same time we had published this paper uh, five or six years ago in clinical cancer research, had published a paper where she showed in culture also the loss of P16 is important in terms of allowing these uh, tumors to grow through oncogene-induced senescence. So um, finally, uh, uh, this slide got, came out as well. Another slide I put in uh, was um, last night was showing uh, earlier studies from um, Fausto Rodriguez when he was still at the Mayo Clinic in which he had shown by fish uh, that in anaplastic pilocytic astrocytomas, there is uh, where you have a high mitotic rate, necrosis, uh, things like that, that uh, so-called anaplastic features, uh, a high percentage of those have biallelic deletion of P16 as well. So um, occasionally, as I mentioned, these things will start growing in the hypothalamus and, and secondarily extend down into the optic nerve. So here's an example of one of these. Uh, that presented initially in a two-year-old. And this tumor has some pylomyxoid features. You're not seeing the, the, the dense pyloid gliosis Rosenthal's. This is maybe not the perivascular orientation, but, but some uh, pylomyxoid features to this one. Um, and this, this tumor grew progressively through chemotherapy and radiation all the way down the optic nerve out to the globe. Um, and you know when you, uh, there, there's some uh, distension and loss of architecture to all these individual bundles of axons because there's tumor cells growing in here um, and uh, making them expand. And when you look under the microscope, you can see little Rosenthal fibers. We found EGBs uh, as these tumor cells are growing down these nerve fascicles. And eventually, uh, this, uh, it made it all the way up to the lamina fibrosa. It did not grow into the eye. So this particular um, uh, case respected that boundary and didn't grow into the eye. Uh, this did have a, a BRAF a gene fusion and, and, and showed P16 loss uh, in the tumor. Um, so we wanted to look uh, at uh, pilocytic astrocytomas of the optic nerve proper. A lot of these early studies we did were um, optic pathway or um, uh, uh, other sites. And so we had worked with Doug Cameron, who was at the um, AFIP at the time, um, and found 59 patients um, from the older files. So the reason we have to go back to the older files, of course, is now uh, we no longer are going to surgically excise uh, or even treat some of these uh, optic nerve pilocytics. So you really have to go back 30, 40, 50, 60 years to find cases in which the eyes and the optic nerves were enucleated in large numbers. And so we were able to, to find 59 of these in the FIP files. Um, and we were able to do then uh, some, some genetic analyses uh, on them. So uh, another thing that came out, um, basically only 15 of these, so we had 59, only 15 of them could we successfully do fish, looking for BRAF uh, duplications, but 11 of the 15 where we could successfully do fish had the BRAF duplication. So a very high percentage of these in the optic nerve proper had um, the, the BRAF duplication. Um, four of the cases were, um, 
from NF patients, and interestingly, there was one, one of those NF patients also had a BRAF duplication. So, so uh, the, the, you can occasionally see uh, both uh, NF and BRAF duplications in the same patient in these optic nerve uh, pilocytics. So this is uh, data from a review article we'd written, and so now uh, there's a larger number of uh, cases here because we're now, I, I just given you numbers, those, those 11 of 15 were just for tumors that arose in the optic nerve proper. If you expand your, your thinking to all of the optic pathway, uh, going back to the hypothalamic and chiasm, uh, and looking in the published literature and our own series, you can get to a larger denominator. Um, using that, about half of them are going to have the, the Kia BRAF fusions, which is a number similar to what you see in brainstem or spinal cord, um, but uh, um, more common than you would see in, in, in cortex or deep gray matter. Of course, the most common place you're going to find these uh, alterations are in the posterior fossa. So there are some treatment implications for, th for uh, this. Um, when it was first discovered that BRAF is a major driver, people got excited about uh, drugging this pathway, and there was an early study of, of uh, treating progressive, aggressive pilocytics, a headquarter which was uh, headed by Matthias Karianis here at NYU using serafinib. Um, uh, our institution was also involved in this trial. Uh, 13 children were enrolled, but we saw a paradoxical increase in growth. Uh, in those cases, similar to what you can see uh, with this paradoxical activation of signaling uh, in the skin sometimes. And so that, that trial was shut down uh, early because of the paradoxical increased growth uh, that was seen uh, with serafinib treatment. There's been a lot more success uh, in targeting this half of things, uh, which you might not you know, think would be active in these BRAF-driven lesions, but in fact they are. Here's some data from our primary optic nerve glioma series um, uh, where Fausto Rodriguez had stained for a number of markers of mTOR pathway activity, and you can see in these primary optic nerve gliomas, there's a fairly high percentage of them that are expressing uh, 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 immunohistological markers of pathway activity. Uh, this is probably the, the, the largest trial to date. It's, it's uh, closed. Uh, the, this, these data are from a, a published uh, abstract from Snow a few years ago. This is a, uh, a trial headed up by Mark Kieran at Dana-Farber. And they had enrolled 23 patients and treated them with uh, uh, RAD001. Um, and they'd shown uh, that they were able to hit targets in these optic pathway. Uh, um, uh, well, these weren't just optic pathway. This is um, pilocytics at multiple sites. Um, uh, they were able to hit targets. Uh, four of the kids had a greater than 50 percent uh, reduction in tumor size, 13 had stable disease, six had progressive disease. So there, there's some promise there, and there's some new trials that are coming which are combining uh, everolimus with other kinds of therapy. Um, here are two children from that trial that were treated at, our, at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, and you can see some of the, 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 the more successful uh, cases. Here's a case in which you had a very large hypothalamic lesion, and it didn't shrink in size, but it sort of hollowed out. You sort of lost uh, all the central contents uh, of the tumor, although there wasn't, a, there wasn't a lot of clinical progression in this case. Uh, here's another case where it was much more dramatic, where you had a large lesion that essentially totally regressed uh, on therapy, um, although it came back subsequently when they were through therapy. So um, I think clearly this by itself is not going to be uh, sufficient, but it's probably going to be a successful component of some sort of multimodal therapy for these more aggressive pilocytics moving forward forward. Um, I've looked at, you know, as, as was stated in the introduction, I love the notch pathway, and we've done uh, some studies uh, looking at notch um, that uh, uh, t turned us towards optic pathway gliomas. This was a paper we published a number of years ago in cancer research in which we had uh, introduced uh, constitutively active forms of notch 3 into the growing fetal eyes and brains of mice. And we got these, this is a small one, but we got very large ones that um, uh, grew out of the optic nerve into the orbit. But this is like a baby, one of these tumors of very bland sort of oligoid glial cells growing uh, underneath the leptomeninges. So this is the optic nerve of the mouse. This is the retina of the mouse. But these could dramatically distend and overtake the whole optic nerve of these animals, uh, but retained a somewhat bland cytology similar to that you would see in a pilocytic. So that would suggest that maybe notch can drive tumors in mice, at least, that look like pilocytics um, of the optic nerve. And in fact, when we looked at a number of uh, human uh, pilocytic astrocytomas, 
um, including four or five of these were lesions from the optic pathways and looked at a number of notch pathway components either by uh, um, uh, RT-PCR at the mRNA level as shown on the left or immunohistochemically as shown on the right, we could see that the notch pathway was, was significantly upregulated. There's normal brain here in the far right. So there was significant upregulation of notch pathway receptors and targets in human pilocytic astrocytomas. Um, we also did some broader gene expression profiling studies um, shown here in, in red on the left is normal brain and in green here on the right are a number of different uh, pilocytic astrocytoma cases. And again, you see upregulation of notch pathway markers in the, in the pilocytic astrocytomas. So there is uh, a significant um, upregulation in, in, at a broader mRNA expression profiling as well. And finally, we, we've done a little bit of work. There's not good pilocytic astrocytoma cell lines that are out, out there to work with. This is a, a, a pediatric low-grade glioma cell line, but not a pilocytic. And when we genetically silence notch signaling using hairpins targeting the, the canonical transcriptional cofactor, it slows the growth of these. So some hope that maybe um, notch inhibitors might work in these lesions as well. Just as a side note, for those of you trying to grow pilocytic astrocytomas uh, in culture, it, uh, or a xenograft, it's just really hard. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll grow for a few passages, but basically all of your um, uh, tumor cells are going to rapidly senesce. And if you actually, you can actually keep things growing. So I've tried to grow like 20 of these over the last 15 years, as xenografts, neurospheres, high serum adherent cell cultures. We're using conditioned reprogram cell conditions right now. And in all of these, you can get things to grow and you get excited, but then when you use fish or other markers and try to prove that the signature genetic change in the primary tumor is there and what you're growing in culture, you don't find it. And what you're actually growing is contaminating astrocytes. Uh, um, and, and, the, and the actually genetically defined pilocytic component is going to be gone rapidly. So I, I would encourage any of you trying to grow, trying to make models of these. If you think you've made a model, prove it to yourself on the genetic level. And I, I'm sorry to say, if you're ever not disappointed and actually do grow something, I, I would love to, to talk to you and, and use that in a collaborative fashion. So you occasionally can see other tumors uh, in the optic pathways. Here's a case I got from Fausto of a ganglioglioma that arose uh, in the optic nerve. Um, a, a lot of it was glial, uh, but there were some uh, uh, ganglion-type cells um, uh, in the tumor, um, and uh, the synaptophysin and chromogranin stains were highlighting uh, that this ganglion cell component. So you, this isn't a great one, but we convinced ourselves this is a real ganglion cell component. You can see them occasionally. Um, very uncommon to find high-grade astrocytomas of the optic nerve. Um, you know, for, for the neuropathologists, obviously, just as true at other sites, pilocytics can have lots of vascular proliferation. They can be fairly cellular. You can see some mitotic activity. As long as you believe that that's a pilocytic astrocytoma, those things are not going to, you know, make this a high-grade glioma. It's still just a pilocytic astrocytoma. As I mentioned earlier, you can have anaplastic pilocytics but they're all pilocytics. Occasionally you see true infiltrative gliomas um, uh, in the optic nerve. I've only seen three or four of them, I think, maybe over the last 20 years. Um, but I wanted to share a case that we had just last month that was really spectacular. So this was a 42-year-old woman who had uh, presented to the ophthalmologist with visual loss in her right eye, had edema of her optic disc, they did an ultrasound, they found a dome-shaped lesion overlying her right optic disc that was about three millimeters thick uh, and uh, saw some enlargement of the optic nerve behind it on ultrasound. Uh, on imaging, you can also see uh, the, the, the thickening uh, and a lesion growing in the right optic nerve. And so the history of this patient is important uh, because she had been diagnosed with an anaplastic astrocytoma of the brain five years previously that had been treated initially with uh, surgery and temidar, um, uh, had eventually progressed to GBM. This was an IDH1, known to be an IDH1 mutant tumor that had lost ATRX uh, and was, had been treated with Avastin and a PD-1 inhibitor, but neither of those things were working very well. And so uh, here's a picture of the initial tumor uh, in this patient, or the, rather the MRI of the, of the radiographic appearance of the original tumor back in the frontal lobe. Uh, here's what it looked like under the microscope, uh, a malignant-looking astrocytoma, uh, clear vascular proliferation, clear necrosis, so clearly a GBM um, after it had progressed. Um, 
And so they went in and did a vitrectomy where they stick a needle back into the, the back of the eye and suck out uh, some vitreous, and they also tried to get a little bit of the superficial tumor. It wasn't really an FNA per se, but they can sort of grab small bits of tumor off the surface uh, of this mass in the back of the eye. And you had these clusters of sort of hyperchromatic cells. There weren't great glial processes, although we didn't have smears to look at. Um, uh, in other areas, the cells look higher grade, and there were some uh, apoptotic or necrotic cells uh, admixed with the, this uh, sort of wispy stuff is the, the vitreous collagen up here on the right, some fairly discohesive thing. Um, and these cells were strongly GFAP positive. A subset of them uh, expressed the glial marker OLIG2 in their uh, nucleus. Uh, they were strongly P53 positive, uh, as was the primary tumor. Uh, they had a high proliferation index on KI67, and generally we don't see rapidly proliferating normal uh, things from inside the retina. Um, and we could see expression of uh, mutant IDH protein on immunostochemistry and loss of HTRX in the uh, neoplastic cells with some rare uh, stromal cells that seem to show retained HTRX. So I think in this case, you, what you had was this, 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 this GBM grew up the optic nerve and into the eye. So, uh, um, but this obviously is not something that you're going to see every day. But in this case, I think uh, the, the uh, the studies strongly suggest that we have a, ge a genetically identical tumor that's grown into the eye that had started back in the frontal lobes uh, of this patient. So I'd just like to stop with that case and uh, thank the, the folks in my lab who've uh, contributed to the research studies I showed you over the years, as well as our collaborators and funders. Thank you very much.